Welcome everyone. Uh, this particular session is devoted to a lecture by a speaker, a scientist, Dr. Tanim Islam. It is going to be on the fusion experiments at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory uh, at the National Ignition Facility. Uh, before we begin the lecture and invite uh, Dr. Lucy Hossein to introduce him, uh, let, let me uh, go through a few uh, housekeeping. Uh, first of all, please uh, mute your mute your uh, mute, mute yourself. Uh, the video can be on. Uh, the lecture is going to be uninterrupted. So do not please do not ask any questions and hold the questions at the at the end. There is going to be a question and answer session at the very end. Uh, so uh, there are two ways that you can ask questions. Uh, please use your hand, raise hand, so that you can be recognized with a question. Or you can use the chat box to pose your question. And Dr. Riftekar Rahman, he is going to be moderating that particular question and answer session. So without uh, the further ado, let me invite Dr. Hossein to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tani Islam. Lucy. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and a warm welcome to those joining us for this segment of a Zoom meeting organized by the Dhaka University Physics Batch of 1969 to 73. In the past, in this segment, we have had cultural programs and talks on charitable works, as well as projects some of us have been involved in. Today, we have something different from our norm. We will showcase the talent and accomplishment of one of our next generation. It is my utmost pleasure to welcome our special speaker for today, Dr. Tanim Islam, who is the son of our very own Dr. Shaheen Islam and Dr. Kazi Tawhidul Islam. Dr. Tanim Islam is an astrophysicist and a scientist working at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. He received his Bachelor of Science in Physics from Caltech in 2000 and his PhD in Astrophysics from the University of Virginia in 2007. His PhD dissertation was on high energy black hole accretion. In the past, Tanim has worked at NASA and Ames Research Center in Mountain View on air traffic control research. Currently at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Tanim works on high altitude nuclear explosions, laser driven experiments and stockpile stewardship. For the past five years, he has worked on unusual ideas such as kernel density estimation for transport, reanalysis and forward modeling of historical underground test data and the modeling and design of high energy density experiments on efficient but lower energy X-ray sources for asteroid deflection and nuclear explosive ground coupling. As a solid state physicist, I find all this high energy lingo sound Greek to me. And like you, I myself will be eagerly looking forward to learning from Tanim's talk today. It is quite rare to find the younger generation following in their parents' professional field. We are so proud of Tanim for his career choice and for his impressive and successful career in astrophysics. In addition, it is really heartwarming and remarkable to see how he has given back to the community through mentorship and outreach opportunity in science, technology, engineering, and math program. In particular, he continues to share his passion and his experience as a scientist 
by encouraging and inspiring young people to explore and pursue STEM. The title of Tanim's talk today is Essential Elements of Successful Ignition at LL, uh, NL's National Ignition Facility. We imagine this lecture on the recent successful fusion experiment at the National Ignition Facility of Lawrence Livermore National Lab will be of interest to physicists, engineers, and others since we believe that a successful fusion spawn power plant someday will provide an inexhaustible source of clean energy on earth. And who wouldn't want that? We have therefore extended the invitation to this meeting to other physicists, as well as engineers, teachers, and students. We hope you will enjoy today's lecture. And so without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Tanim Islam. Thank you very, very much, Lucianti, for this warm, generous introduction. And thank you, Dr. Rahman, for moderating the question and answer session. And I guess this is going to be a little different in that usually the lectures I do that are where I can see the public, uh, I usually have the back and forth, but we'll try something different for me, the questions till at the end. Okay, uh, with that, I guess I can get started. Oh, and also thanks to Abu for organizing this lecture and doing all the IT infrastructure. I know I don't have the patience to do that stuff anymore. <laughs> and thanks uh, for the, Hockey University Physics Alumni Committee for, you know, hosting and publicizing this event. Okay, and with that, let me see what I can do. Ah, uh, the share screen. Here we go. So, too many. Okay, let's, so yes, uh, I'm going to be actually talking not so much about my work, but a summary of the work that others have done uh, in making a successful ignition event at Livermore Labs. Um, this is the event of the past five months. It's five months ago, or actually six months ago now, in December 2022, that produced 3.2 uh, megajoules of fusion energy uh, with the two megajoules of laser energy that went into this tiny capsule. So I think uh, you heard actually a lot more stuff about me <laughs> that I'll go into here, but uh, specifically, you know, putting myself and my work and my employment in context. I'm a physicist at Livermore Labs. Uh, who has just recently, and by recently in the past year and a half, started to use the laser facility, the NIFR National Ignition Facility, for my experiments. Uh, I am not, I, I want to make this clear, I'm not someone who works intimately or even tangentially on NIF. I'm more of a, a user of these facilities, and I work closely with uh, shot engineers who do work on NIF all the time, not only on my experiment, but also on others. And uh, I borrow most, perhaps all the interesting content in these slides from one scientist who actually helped make ignition happen. He was actually a, a crucial member of the team um, who made ignition happen. Uh, this uh, scientist, Omar Hurricane, that is his real name, is <laughs> an amazing person. <laughs> He's very approachable. In fact, I was like, um, uh, I like to see, you know, uh, uh, towards a not deep scientist who works in this field audience on what they, what the ignition effort was. And he was uh, generous enough to provide his slides, which I've changed only a little bit from what he's given me. And where I use his content uh, in part or in whole, 
I make a note of it on the lower right. So this talk, it's, uh, it's going to go a little quicker than, you know, the full one hour. There'll be a long, you know, long period of time to ask me questions and to have me go into more detail on the work I do at the lab, as well as the little bit more that I can talk about, uh, you know, inertial fusion. So there are four main things I'm gonna go through in this talk. The NIF, what is it? What is, what, what is a hull ROM? And the essential elements of inertial, in this case, it, what's called indirect drive uh, fusion. The big chunk of this talk is going to be uh, the elements of success at NIF. And there's been, it's really been a 20 year effort from when NIF was first conceived to now to get, uh, you know, fusion, ignition happening. So of course I'm not going through all the details or even uh, uh, an incomplete summary of everything that, you know, made the ignition shots happen. I'm just going to introduce it a little bit and, uh, you know, talk about it just, a, you know, a little bit more. Uh, the third point, it's only a few slides. I know that uh, people have been saying fusion as an inexhaustible source of clean energy, uh, but in practice, we can only do fusion with deuterium tritium fusion, which is uh, not yet at the stage of being a clean or practical source of fusion power, but it's still very useful. And I'll go through also some of the uses there. And finally, I'll end with a few slides of the work I do, the experiments that I run at the National Ignition Facility. So here it is. In fact, uh, there's, I've been at the lab for 12 years and I think thousands of people, uh, especially mostly even people who aren't even employees have looked at uh, the insides of the NIF, have gotten tours of the NIF uh, much more than I have, even though I actually have experiments on it. So what is it? It's, uh, if you look from the outside, the gigantic building, uh, you know, at the northeast corner that houses the laser facilities that deliver, uh, you know, megajoules of laser energy to a target that is about a millimeter across. So full size, it's 96 laser beams on each side. And it's, you know, if you unfold each uh, laser line, it's probably around half a mile long from one end to the other, all the way to the, what's called a NIF target chamber. And uh, to actually power a single shot, a full energy shot, it takes uh, 300 to 400 megajoules of electrical energy into capacitor banks. We don't have our own power plant on site. We get it from the uh, same utility that provides the power that, you know, powering uh, the electricity at my home, Pacific Gas and Electric. And it is very big, very heavy, and operates under clean room conditions for big chunks of it, especially where the lasers go through, um, you know, these pipes in the target chamber. So this, if you see over there on your, um, I guess, this two megajoules of blue light, that is the actual size of, a, of this thing called a hall ROM which is the thing that converts uh, you know, laser light into X-ray energies that can crush this capsule. So the way it works, I mean, I'm giving you the very highest level details. This three megajoules of red light is converted uh, frequency, uh, you know, tripled to two megajoules of blue light. Why uh, blue instead of red, it has to deal with physics and laser plasma interactions. It's basically a lot easier to symmetrize the laser with blue light than red light. And there are many, many plasma physicists. Uh, a good friend of mine, David Strosi, could go into great detail 
on all the physics and engineering details of that process and how much easier it is to do uh, basically laser drive with blue light. So by that, the blue light, this two megajoule is a thing that goes into the target chamber and hits that tiny target. That is actually full-sized. It's about, you know, a little smaller than a person's fingernail or thumbnail. And out of that, uh, this two megajoule of, of the two megajoules that actually hit the, you know, out, inner surface of that hull rom, there's a tinier few hundred micron radius capsule that sits in the middle of it. 250 kilojoules of the X-rays that are produced are absorbed at, onto the capsule. And of that, only 20 kilojoules of the internal energy goes into compressing and heating the deuterium tritium fuel that produces in the ignition shot the uh, 3.2 megajoules of fusion energy. This is sort of a cartoon model of it. <laughs> um, so you can see sort of these stocks on the left hand most image. Um, these 192 beams of light, the 96 plus 96 uh, shine onto, actually these are called 192 quads. Each quad has four beams themselves. So 192 times four, a uh, lot and lot of beams uh, shine, actually, no, no, I was right the first time. It's 192 beams shine onto, you know, these, this inner surface of the hull rod. And uh, what they do is that laser energy is converted into X-rays. This is called indirect drive because the X-rays provide a very high temperature, high energy, high pressure, uh, uniform bath that uniformly compresses and rocket ablates out the outer surface of this, uh, this capsule. So that's seen in sort of this middle you know, figure here, 150 megabar, megabar is one atmosphere. And one of the benefits of this uniform drive is that this X-ray radiation is actually the, you could think of it as the highest pressure hammer we can provide to materials uh, uh, according to our current expertise. It's actually uh, in, when this thing actually explodes, uh, you reach pressures and densities uh, at say, the center of the earth. And there's nowhere else uh, where we can, uh, where we have a laboratory that can explore that, uh, that uh, you know, basically pressure density or materials regime. So that's uh, point four. The, basically the thing is rocketing inwards and compressing and compressing. And then at bang time, you know, everything happens all at once on, under half a nanosecond this thing will produce basically all its DT fusion energy. And this is a hard problem because if you see on the lower left-hand side, the center of the capsule, the DT you know, fuel, light, fuel um, region, that hot spot, has to get down to a factor of 35 to 40 reduction in length before you know, it actually is able to ignite. And the problem with that is, well, uh, that material which started out as a gas, uh, a cryogenic gas, you know, before the laser shot out, becomes a plasma and under what we call degenerate conditions. That is, the pressure is at least partially uh, supported by electron degeneracy. Again, another thing that uh, we don't see except for the electron gas in metals. And so it is an extremely hard problem. Also, the third point is uh, this 35 to 40 factor of reduction in size means that any kind of imperfection, either in the uh, drive itself, asymmetry in the drive, or imperfection in the actual shape of this capsule, 
means that it could easily disassemble, not actually, you know, compress uniformly and produce uh, only a tiny fraction or no DT fusion. And that was a problem for uh, really until last, I guess, 2021, August of 2021, when this was something we didn't quite know if we'd really ever get to, get to, you know, fully resolve. So I'm just going to skip this movie because it's, uh, it's basically saying everything I did. So the way, uh, this is where I'm actually borrowing also from Omar's talk in some more detail. This is the uh, machinery behind how this thing uh, actually explodes. Um, I guess it's, uh, it's hot spot ignition. The analogy I've seen is it's more like, a, you know, a, a standard, you know, if you think of an internal combustion engine car, it's this gasoline power fuel injection. Uh, kind of mechanism rather than something like a diesel engine. So the way it happens is uh, this is, of course, the reaction that we're able to get going. Deuterium's postridiums produce neutrons and alphas. And the whole thing produces, you know, 17.6 MeVs of, uh, you know, energy that comes out, extra energy that comes out. And if uh, as physicists, you might be able to appreciate momentum conservation and energy conservation, the neutron is, you know, a factor of five, uh, you know, reduced in mass to the alpha particle. So <laughs> it comes out with 80% of the kinetic energy uh, of the, you know, the DT reaction. Interesting thing though, is that in this fusion process, uh, to get the thing to actually run away to occur, we can't actually uh, take energy out of the neutrons. The neutrons are actually a loss. Any neutrons that are produced uh, are just you know, basically taken out of the system. They're, they're not uh, recycled in some sense to produce, uh, you know, to get fusion to happen like you know, heating up this material or, or, or things of that nature, basically recycling energy back into the problem. It's the alphas that actually have to do that work because neutrons are, have no charge. And uh, basically the, the, uh, that small material, however dense it becomes, is uh, really still has too small of an aerial mass density to actually stop the neutrons themselves. So basically it's the alphas that have to be trapped in this hot spot for long enough and for enough of them so that a feedback occurs and you get basically uh, actual more efficient uh, DT fusion to occur. That is getting most of the, or a significant fraction of the DT uh, to, to burn. So it was successful and uh, I'll just, I think what I'll say here is uh, the thing that started us on the path really was the August, 2021 shot um, where I was actually on vacation. And that was one of the things I listened to uh, while I was on vacation was a preliminary, a, a, an internal town hall which talked about it, which was uh, the full NIF laser facility, the three to two mega, the three converted to two megajoules of blue laser light produced a, you know, capsule that produced 1.3 megajoules of DT fusion energy. And December, 2022 was treated as a rousing success. It is one where uh, the gain was greater than one because more energy came out in DT fusion, 3.2 megajoules, than was put into the uh, blue laser light that actually went into the hull ROM. Now, an interesting way I like to think of it as in terms of the burn efficiency. That is, you have a certain mass of deuterium tritium fuel in your capsule 
and what percentage of that fuel was actually burned. If you just uh, account for the mass of the DT, all the DT in that capsule that you know does anything, it was about four and a half percent, which is, uh, you know, I'm sort of a kind of a pessimist some ways. I'm saying it's great, but there's room for improvement. Uh, a plausible, maximally efficient, you know, DT burning device. Uh, if we take that same capsule, we can get up to, you know, 60%, which means that with this same capsule, uh, if we improve things maybe a little more, we can get out to maybe 40 megajoules of DT fusion energy may be possible. That's, I guess, for these kinds of capsules, you could think of it as a design limit on how much energy uh, can actually come out of them. So here I, again, defer to the expertise of one of the main physicists who actually made uh, you know, this ignition work happen, not only you know, over the past year, but over the past 10 plus years. He was an integral part of a campaign that you know, addressed all the issues that I've, um, I've just, I'm just summarizing here. So to get it working, you have got to control the hydro instabilities and the X-ray drive symmetry. Basically, you have to ensure that you, what you know uh, ignites at bang time, uh, what at bang time when the you know capsule ignites, that little pocket is as symmetric as possible. You'd also ideally like to get as much energy, you know, into the uh, capsule as possible. So you have a little bit of a problem. Uh, just conceptually, you can get very good symmetry uh, if you make your capsule smaller and smaller, because it's just going to take up a, a, you know, a smaller and smaller volume, and it's going to see less and less of a variation in the X-ray field that is inside this this uh, this hull rod. The problem with that is you'll have less energy available to um, to get uh, to to actually do anything to actually drive this capsule, it is a very tricky design process. That uh, unless you actually work on this, uh, it defies very obvious intuition. So, <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of explanations that I'm leaving out that he included in his talk. Uh, that deal with basically points one and two in some more detail. The third point I'm going to talk about a little bit, it's very important and it turns out it was very important and it's easy to understand. You needed, it turned out you also needed to engineer all the capsule parts to not only be symmetric, but basically defect free. And by that, I mean, uh, you could, it's basically, the atomic defects, and you can only tolerate atomic defects in this capsule, uh, in all parts of the capsule, only maybe 10 or so in each main part of the capsule. That turned out to be a necessary condition to get this, you know, these ignition capsules to work. So it is an unbelievably, unbelievably difficult engineering problem. And for that part, it was actually not really the people at NIF who made that happen, but the people who fashion these capsules or, or uh, are on site to you know, grow uh, these capsules uh, who made it happen, General Atomics. Uh, they are really world experts at this. And all of that, you know, because you want your thing that bangs to be symmetric even when it's compressed by a factor of 35 to 40 in size. So this is what I meant. This is um, the way I would like, I thought about that is an, as an AB comparison. And it's, uh, it's really uh, sort of expanded on from the uh, internal town hall meeting of August, 2021 is there is, Basically, there was a capsule and a design that 
did not work so well in February 2021. And in, uh, what is it, August 2021, it worked. The only things that really changed were, you see everything in this green thing in the middle here? All that changed was maybe everything the same, but removing those defects. That is basically getting something that didn't have those occlusions uh, that the February 2021 shot did. And lo and behold, at that point, uh, it produced, uh, was it 1.3 megajoules of DT fusion energy. I had a question, um, you know, I think, I don't even remember to Omar Hurricane or other people the, in the, who work in NIF, maybe not on the ignition campaign. I was like, well, this is a really hard engineering fabrication process. You know, uh, naively, I think a company like NVIDIA, you know, if they want the highest quality, you know, I guess graphics card, why don't they just uh, make 20 and choose the one or two that don't have the issues? Unfortunately, it's not that simple in the NIF, uh, you know, ignition campaign, because it's not as if, uh, like in the targets in my experiment, where they're built externally and shipped, you know, from San Diego, uh, where General Atomics is based, to uh, you know Livermore, California. These are cryogenically target cryogenic target capsules that where big parts of it, the DT parts, the ice layer and the gas, are actually grown. They crystallize, you know, over a day or so in a cryogenically frozen target chamber. So they actually cool down this seven meter radius target chamber to, uh, you know, I think, well, what is the freezing point of hydrogen? Something like 20 kelvins. So they have to cool it down to that much. They have to basically grow it atomically. I don't know the process, but it accretes not only just hydrogen or not only just deuterium, but deuterium tritium uh, ice and deuterium tritium gas over a day. And it has to, I hope I'm, you know, I, I'm belaboring this point. It also has to have really almost unresolvable atomic level defects to get it to happen. And so this is not a process where you can however expensive it is, where you can make 20 or 30 and just choose the top two. You have to basically get it right uh, the first time or you have to scrub your shot. So higher priority, a lot of technical expertise to make it happen. I'll just uh, point out, here's uh, you know, the, 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 the ignition shot, the, what is it? The December 2022 is basically a relatively small delta from the August 2021 shot. So I'll start there. So I'll just say that this is a kind of non-standard hull run, but it's one where all these details matter to basically uh, increase uh, the symmetry as much as they were able to. Uh, decrease the effect of any instabilities that might uh, be seeded by things that are not, you know, spherically symmetric. And also to increase the coupling of the X-ray energy, you know, that comes out from the inner surface and, you know, actually does work on the capsule. And it's a very high power, you know, two megajoules of laser energy. So the scale on in this power profile is, well, it looks like over about, you know, five to six nanoseconds, it produces, you know, 500 terawatts of laser power going into something that it starts out two millimeters by one millimeter in radius. So that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty high energy density in there. And 
at the level of even people who work on NIF, we're basically, you know, we're treating this as this is just a design. We don't quite know why exactly it works, but we found it was necessary to do these things to begin to, you know, get on the road to ignition. So the 2022, December 2022 shot, the you know, shot heard around the world, at least in terms of inertial fusion was a relatively small delta from that design. It used the same kind of, you know, hull ROM, that same kind of, you know, gold, gold shield, gold sort of box, but it made the uh, capsule a little thicker. It gave a little more energy to the laser. You know, you look in the bottom figure there, uh, all it did, that's, I, that's really the small bit of change that was needed to be done. Uh, just make that laser produce a little more energy and produce, you know, just push the laser drive out a little further. And so what's happening is that this thing at, you know, bang time, the, the, the August 2021 shot at bang time, it has some kind of squash shape. Whereas in December, the December 2022 shot at bang time has a very, you know, symmetric shape. And we believe, or they believe, that this is, uh, we're actually now exploring a space where, you know, we get a reliable, you know, more than break-even ignition. So, you know, on the left, the older shot, 1.37 kilo megajoules, and the new shot, almost 3.2 megajoules. And uh, well, that's pretty much it. I mean, I figure in the question and answer session, I can go into more detail about uh, where, where people might have some questions that I didn't go into here on how we got you know, ignition to work. Now I'm going to do a little bit of an aside on, well, fusion as a clean energy source. It is certainly you know, plausible in the future that this will happen, but uh, I, I wanna be clear, and definitely the people at NIF are very clear, that what we can reliably do right now, the best we can do right now, we can only do with deuterium tritium fission. Uh, which you saw you know, a few slides back. The problem with that, right, is it produces neutrons beyond the fact that neutrons can't really um, contribute to the, uh, to the ignition process by say heating that hotspot or the rest of the capsule. Uh, they pose a significant hazard because it leads to neutron embrittlement and uh, it, <laughs> basically irradiates the target chamber. It becomes radioactively hot. A lot of the, uh, what is it, iron and other uh, transition metals in the target chamber get neutron activated and you know, produce some, uh, <laughs> a lot of beta emission for a day or so, since their half-lives are a few hours to like half a day uh, before, uh, before people can actually, you know, use the chamber again, like run experiments. Now there's no credible mechanism to fully capture the energy loss to neutrons because they're neutral. There are speculative designs, but uh, they uh, involve basically creating a nuclear power plant uh, running on DT fusion, which again, we're not there yet because it's still a very much a, research process to produce a, you know, a more than break even ignition capsule. And the third point, the T in the DT process is they require tritium, which is a very radioactive and hard to make hydrogen isotope and not really something that could be credibly classified as clean. So for the foreseeable future, the idea of processes like deuterium deuterium fusion, which if we can get working, sounds like an interesting idea because 
with one in 5,000, you know, hydrogen atoms, our deuterium is something we can easily extract from say seawater. Um, we're not there yet. So in the immediate and near term, what we'll use basically these ignition capsules with DT as sources useful for plasma and particle irradiation experiments. That is, for instance, the effects of hard neutron radiation on, on you know, metal parts or other materials that we're interested in uh, as sort of a source to creates a video for applications in stockpile stewardship. A little more of an aside here is um, uh, more, I would figure a more useful candidate, a more useful thing to look at is other sort of a neutronic uh, thermonuclear fusion reactions. So in red is DT, right? Which is relatively easy to do. Uh, it's really the easiest fusion reaction we can do, which you know gives out 17.6 MeVs of neutron energy. But I'm showing now three other a neutronic reactions that uh, will only produce charged particles. The benefit of those is because they're charged. The only thing they produce are charged particles. Everything, every product of that reaction can be, uh, you know can contribute to you know, sustaining or helping the ignition process of any kind of inertial fusion reaction or capsule that we have. So these are three sort of plausible candidate ones. The, the fourth one, the hydrogen hitting boron is actually a business plan, I think, Tri Alpha Energy, a nuclear fusion startup that uh, exploring this idea. And I'm gonna end here, at least on the main part of the talk with, well, uh, DT is really the easiest thing to do. And to illuminate this, uh, it's, it's not supposed to be instructive on how to design you know, uh, a capsule. Or it's basically to illuminate the fact that Right now, all we can do is really DT. The blue line, so what I'm showing here are temperatures reminiscent of what happens when the ignition capsule goes bang. It, it, it reaches temperatures of, you know, uh, a million to one and a half million Kelvins. So that's why it's on the X axis. On the Y axis is basically a, representative fusion power density in terms of terawatts per cubic centimeter. And this is the fusion power density if the two reactants have a molar density of one mole per cc. So you could think of it as, you know, at a million kelvins, if you had a mole of cc, mole per cc of deuterium and tritium, you'd have something like uh, a petawatt or a thousand terawatts per cc of fusion power coming out of it. The thing to notice is all the other, uh, except for at the lower temperatures, all the other, you know, fusion processes uh, go down to, you know, three to six orders of magnitude below the uh, fusion power that DT does, it is a very hard problem. And a big reason why they go down so much lower is because with D and T, right? You're having uh, one particle with a charge state of one hitting another particle with a charge state of one. With all the other processes, the aneutronic one, the three aneutronic ones I'm showing you, it's starting off with a charge state of one and two, or even three or four. So because of that, the Coulombic barrier is a lot higher and you know, a factor of two, three, or four higher than if you, they both had a charge state of one. And so necessarily, just by that effect alone, it is uh, going to lead to 
a much reduced, uh, uh, you know, reactivity, a much reduced fusion power, effective fusion power. And so it makes, given our current engineering and technology, these other fusion processes uh, interesting, but, you know, not there yet. Now, finally, end off with something that I can actually describe in even more detail, which is how I'm a user of the National Ignition Facility. So the thing I do at NIF is this experimental campaign called Starbright. And it's a platform to produce a high efficiency laser-driven X-ray source. I have a, a different kind of hull ROM, it's called a half ROM, because the lasers don't come out come in on both ends, they come in on one end. And uh, it's an efficient X-ray source used for doing nuclear explosive ground coupling, which uh, you mentioned, and an energy source for asteroid defense experiments. And in some sense, this experimental campaign is easy because instead of using the full you know, suite of lasers at the National Ignition Facility, each shot uses only 10 kilojoules of laser energy. So it's a factor of uh, 10, yeah, 100 lower than what goes into you know, these big ignition campaigns. So the thing to note here, I mean, I, I just copied this from uh, a bunch of, you know, uh, I guess, effectively grant proposal slides, uh, uh, sort of uh, shots, uh, you could call it uh, shot proposal slides. So the idea is you do ground coupling experiments because the old ground coupling experiments were done only with uh, high explosives. Whereas with a nuclear device uh, in the very beginning stages, uh, three times as much energy comes out of the nuke in x-rays as in actual mechanical energy, the material exploding outwards and being hot. And this thing is a plasma and it's basically, it's dominated by radiative x-ray energy. And we don't currently have, we haven't actually modeled the physics behind it. And something like this is, you know, actually would be useful to uh, do a physics you know, modeling of this effects curve, basically, with a realistic uh, kind of scaled nuclear device rather than a high explosive experiment, which is just hydrodynamic instead of radiation hydrodynamic. It's also plays a role in, you know, asteroid defense applications. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the DART mission or have heard about it, but it was a NASA mission to send uh, a satellite uh, just to slam, slam into a moon of this double moon asteroid uh, system to impart, basically push this thing, you know, a few, impart this whole thing a few centimeters per second more in one direction or another. So what I'm showing here is observatories, uh, you know, seeing this asteroid, resolving it in time as the, uh, as the satellite, the NASA satellite crashed into uh, the, the moon of that asteroid system. So it gets a little bright and what you're seeing is the plume from the moon uh, as this, thing, you know, just basically exploded outward and created uh, this ejecta uh, and a new crater on that moon. Interesting stuff that we're doing right now. The stuff I would do, I guess, as an asteroid deflector would be a nuke that you stand off maybe uh, a meter or, you know, 10 meters or so from the surface. And it's the X-ray ablation from that surface which imparts, you know, a few centimeters per second away from this asteroid. And if you do impart that 
impulse, uh, you know, a few decades away, an asteroid with a high risk of hitting Earth would then no longer, you know, actually, uh, actually hit Earth. It would just miss it. So this is the uh, this is the fiducial target. Uh, the lasers go on in on the left side. They hit the right side. And the X-ray source is what comes out of the outer surface on the right side. It'll be hopefully a little clearer here. It is this is just the fiducial design? You're hitting a laser, you know, onto that surface, and what it does, it uh, you know makes it hot, and it starts uh, emitting a lot of X-rays, you know, out on this end. And uh, we've fielded a bunch of experiments that demonstrate that this kind of target is actually sufficiently efficient. That is, it converts a sufficient amount of the laser energy into X-rays for it to be useful for you know, these ground coupling and asteroid deflection experiments. And with that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's all I have to talk about. I actually thought I'd go through it uh, quicker, but um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm, if anybody has any questions, I guess now's the time. Okay, thank you, Tanim. Uh, you can uh, close the slides. Okay. Okay, we are back into our usual format. Mm -hmm. uh, now it is the time for questions and answers. So this section is Dr. Ithaka Rahman is going to moderate. So I have a question that I see from either Lucy or Manav Manwar Bhai. Mm -hmm. so, do you want me to go first or you want to do? Yes, you go ahead. So... Uh, Tani, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, a lot of things we learned today that uh, you know we we kind of have not stayed up up to date for a long time. So it's very very useful. Uh, but looking very realistically, uh, where we are today, a commercially usable system. I would say it will be about 20 more years at least. Is this about right? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, when the National Ignition Facility started, uh, people said it would be maybe five years away. Um, it turned out even to get to this point, you know, it took 20 years from groundbreaking basically to to you know these uh, these ignition shots, and even it's not as if we can make these reliable. We still, I I, I want to point out that I might have described some necessary conditions in terms of the design of the hull rom, the design of the capsule and the laser drive, but they might uh, they might not be sufficient conditions, and it's. Uh, it is a very hard problem to do. Um, of course, inertial fusion is one avenue. There might be uh, magnetic fusion is another thing people are exploring, but it's, it's quite difficult to do. And uh, I know that the magnetic fusion efforts uh, of which ITER is, is a research reactor rather than a, a commercial one. They also use DT fuel and they have many of the similar problems. That is what to do with the neutrons that this thing produces. So it's, um, it might be an interesting idea. <laughs> D-helium-3 would be probably, if we get the technology to produce that, that I think would be an interesting thing to explore. 20 years in the future, I'm not sure. I, I couldn't, I'm, I don't feel comfortable giving a time still. I, if it does happen, it might be a something very unusual that makes it happen, like unusually powerful magnets that uh, 
that maybe allow us to not only do DT, but maybe D helium three or things of that nature. Yeah, I, 20 uh, I, is probably the optimistic side because it's the physics part of it and then all the engineering part of it, that is the distribution, uh, conversion of the power, distribution of the power and so on and so forth. That's extremely hard. You yes. Know, anything to, to build with the infrastructure or that sort of thing, right? So unless there is a real breakthrough, uh, it's going to be very hard to make it commercially usable. That's my... Yes, yes, I think so. I mean, uh, the, the national labs are very interested in these these uh, very fast, you know, high energy neutron sources for our applications. Uh, a lot of it is stockpile stewardship stuff. There's some nucleosynthesis applications. Basically, you might be exploring the neutron fluences that, that are important in, say, X-ray bursters or gamma ray bursters, things like that. Uh, so it might have some astrophysical applications. It's also a platform separate from you know, ignition. It's a platform that can reach these very high pressures, you know, gigabars uh, that are you know, what we see inside stars or at the center of the earth or other you know, planets. And that by itself is you know, interesting to interesting to explore the equation of state, for instance, of material at the Earth's core, or uh, the physics of how, you know, ice giants produce their magnetic fields, how those dynamos operate. wonder how you're done. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm... <laughs> uh, okay, Kandagar, go ahead. Unmute, Karo. Please unmute. And a really nice talk. I uh, really learned a lot. Had never uh, uh, gone into details. Uh, just if I understood it correctly, uh, by the way, I'm really excited that even in principle, uh, fission can be done. Um, so you emphasized a lot about having a very high pressure. So I'm assuming yeah. that this is patient needs a very high pressure. And and we're sort of limited by the fact that, uh, you know, two megajoules of energy sounds like a lot, but we can get a more favorable convergence ratio. That is basically get fusion to occur in a capsule. Uh, if we had access to uh, more laser energy, if we had four or five or six, uh, then it actually becomes a lot more possible. The capsules become larger, the hull ROMs become larger, and uh, we get a lot more energy out of it. In fact, an argument could be made, we can get more easily a much more efficient uh, you know, energy source. Remember, I gave a plausible limit of, uh, was it 60 megajoules out of this, or 40 megajoules yeah. Uh, yeah. for something if we had access to something like five or six megajoules of laser energy, we could get down, get up to a gigajoule in, in, of fusion energy out of the capsule. And uh, with, I would say, engineering and physics constraints that we don't have um, with this design. That is, we could get a we could get a gigajoule burning capsule with uh, something we have, we can compress by only a factor of 20 or so, which we've been able to do simulationally and also much easier to do experimentally uh, for decades now. I'm thinking from the, coming from the other side. I mean, uh, it is because you're insisting on DT, but that's the worst yeah. kind of uh, <laughs> uh, Well, yeah. it's dirty, but it's the yeah. easiest to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you mentioned that the other things are uh, the difficulty with, let's say, boron or uh, bigger nuclei is the electron pressure, right? 
Well, the charge state, uh, it's like a collisional process. So it's, there's both the natural, you know, uh, interaction cross section for a fusion process, but, you know, it's got to also tunnel through uh, just the Coulombic barrier. Uh, yeah, but and you so are, you are finding X-rays. So X-rays are something that will ionize almost all of this nuclei, right? So well, the is, thing to, and can you just uh, use the ionized version of this one that will well, this is a lot more pressure? You bring up an in, interesting point called direct drive. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, or another concept is sort of pycnonuclear fusion, which is you. It's it's very speculative. I don't, people aren't really sure it will work, uh, but the idea is you just cold compress material uh, that is uh, that's fusible, and then it undergoes fusion. Uh, with something like this, you think of the laser, the X-rays, as just a hammer. Mm -hmm. Think of it as really a hammer. It both heats up and presses the material such that it reaches conditions that can undergo fusion. So it basically compresses things so that they, you know, temperatures are, you know, um, in the millions of Kelvins and its densities are, you know, uh, up to a few hundred grams per cc of DT plasma. So <laughs> it's, uh, Tricky to do. Uh, this, yeah. I mean, I'm surprised we got as far as we did. It was. Yeah, not. It I, was. I, I must admit, I'm surprised too. <laughs> <laughs> now, thank you very much. It was a very, very uh, uh, informative talk. Thank you. thank you. Okay. So next, Tohid. Uh, Tani, it's, uh, it's an excellent talk. I must say, and not just saying. As a father, but I know that you're a good speaker. Uh, mm -hmm. The question that I had that uh, the, some of the commercial developments that we had seen by alternate techniques, the confinement, plasma confinement, one of the companies uh, is 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 making a big claim. They said that they are committed to make a five megawatt. Plant yes, by 2000, that. 2000, yes. 2028, and Microsoft invested something like hundred million dollars in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, what, you, what is your take or take on it? I don't know. I don't know in any detail. I think I've just looked at the um, same news articles that you have. It sounds. It might be even Tri Alpha Energy. I'm. I'm not sure. The one that has the hydrogen boron fusion process. Uh, yeah. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't tell you uh, what uh, what their chances of success are because I don't know. Uh, in any, I can't comment credibly on their on their process. Um, although I know just from a physics perspective, it's a very hard. It's very hard to get fusion to occur. <laughs> you have to make yeah. it very hot, and uh, and even there. Honestly, where, for instance, D helium three becomes usable, uh, you have to get to plasma temperatures of a hundred million kelvins or above, and that's I have no idea. I, it's getting out to ten million kelvins is already at the limit of our technological abilities. And uh, uh, I, I, I was really very optimistic that it is. It is, it is something, it's coming in within say, five years. So I'll be really seeing something like that. Wow. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless something really surprising happens. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there are other alternatives instead of using lasers. Uh, there are ideas of using sort of these, uh, what are called Z pinches, these, uh, you know, lines of, vertical lines of current to provide, you know, uh, J cross B forces, magnetic pressure to heat up and compress a capsule. So instead of using a laser, you'd use uh, this 
this J cross B force because uh, you know the I, I guess I could say the currents are moving you know up down vertically. It's a solenoid, yeah. mm -hmm. so you have a toroidal you know magnetic field. So any kind of forces, plasma forces, you get the J cross B, the thing that's going to move that plasma is something that's going to move in radial. And so you can uh, you can get up to you know basically ignition, probably ignition relevant uh, you know conditions with that sort of uh, sort of engineering or that mechanism. The benefit of that is it's a lot more efficient and cheaper per uh, per you know megajoule of energy that goes into the capsule. You could think of it as say. 250 kilojoules. This is a fiducial amount that of X-ray energy goes into the capsule to make it do something. Uh, with NIF, you need 300 to 400 megajoules, right? With something like the Z pinches, uh, like the one at Sandia, and there are new ones that other that are being built in the U.S. and other countries. You might be able to get that down to 30 or 40 megajoules if you can get a system like that working. So already right there, there's in some sense a factor of 10 improvement in terms of uh, you know, power plant practicality of uh, you know, getting, getting a commercial or at least a, a more reliable uh, ignition source up and, up and running. That's really, that's, that sounds like an interesting, you know, uh, avenue to explore in terms of, you know, nuclear fusion uh, as a commercial, a commercial concern. Because you know, if you can, if you, if you have to start out with three hundred or four hundred megajoules just to get that thing out, it looks pretty inefficient. But if you can get it down to, you know, thirty or forty, well, it seems a lot better. <laughs> 30 or 40 is a lot easier than 300 to 400. Whereas and if you can get it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, if I can, well, it's like a stupid question, but still, mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me that exactly what was the value of Q? Say it's one and, uh, and the other people who are doing this uh, magnetic confinement people they say that it should be at least 10 q equal to 10 for a commercial plant and how yes, much is there, oh well uh, i i don't know off the top of my head it's something you know uh some of the people at nif there were probably some slides that i i forgot about that that had that value in there um but I guess 10 sounds like, you know, something you need to do. Uh, and this is not just limited to, I think, fusion. You need something like that for fission, for coal, for natural gas. Uh, this Q of 10 to, you know, make, make stuff work it is more of a universal metric of making a commercial plant working. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I think... I don't think we're there yet, and it might not even make sense because not only there is there the queue, but how quickly can you, uh, you know, run this uh, burst of energy? You know, what's the cadence? And there, uh, yeah, it's uh, the queue. Actually, you could look at it also from a charitable way. You you need four hundred megajoules of electrical energy to produce three megajoules of fusion energy. So we're not at the power plant stage yet. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, some, some, uh, some of your critics, especially uh, some from the Princeton, they said that they're going never going to do it and don't expect that the fusion plants are look like this NIF. And because they said that the fusion heat to electrical power means its uh, design is uh, inherently impracticable. Do you so, agree with this? Well, this is a- If I were a dictator, here's what I would do. 
is the uh, rapist the people that are saying <laughs> it, it, if i were a dictator and i could just throw money and effort uh, i would say let's push heavily towards these you know uh, what is it the z pinch or pulse power systems where you use magnetic compression because to get the energy you need out to you know uh, produce at the same amount of x-rays to couple to this capsule. There are big issues with, can we produce that amount of x-ray energy? Can we make it symmetric? Those are really the big issues uh, with these pulse power, basically driven indirect drive systems like at Sandia. Uh, if we get that happening, it'll be a lot cheaper. We can even have a sort of bigger pulse power system so that we can deal with bigger, make bigger capsules and still have them ignite. It's basically the idea of, you know, laser energies of five to six megajoules. We can get away with a bigger capsule that will ignite uh, under more favorable con conditions like a uh, compression factor of 20. And it's a lot bigger. Maybe the volume is, uh, it's uh, five or six times larger than what we have. And uh, we produce now a gigajoule of energy. So I'm just thinking <laughs> a pulse power system that maybe takes in, you know, 70 megajoules, right? Because we're doing the same factor of 10 reduction from what a laser driven system would do of that big capsule that would still go in this bigger laser facility that now produces a gigajoule or more of energy. And then suddenly, yeah, now we can think of power plant things because now we're actually taking out, producing a lot more energy than we put in. But uh, <laughs> maybe that's in the later pile. <laughs> but yeah, right now, you know, three is a lot, lot smaller than 300, right? <laughs> so maybe we're not there yet. Well, ultimately, the people, uh, ultimately, the most important thing is cost is the central to its success, cost. So whoever is doing, now many people are doing it. Even China claims that they are going to get it by 28. And uh, okay. also Oxford Maybe. people, they are saying that uh, they are also getting it by 28. And then, of course, you know the developments in Princeton. It might process. become relatively obvious in hindsight, <laughs> but it doesn't look very obvious right now what's going to happen. The success metric maybe is kind of obvious. Whatever they do, you know, they're basically going to get something that produces a lot more energy than they put in. And I don't know what the flavor of that will be. A lot of people are looking at it. So maybe in five years, We'll see what happens, or maybe yeah, we sooner. Are forward. We, are, we are looking forward to you. <laughs> I don't know how much of an, how much I'll contribute to that effort. I do other things, but <laughs> I'm into the fusion energy. I think Tahit, there are no more questions. Tanim, there are no more questions. I didn't see anything on the chat, in the chat box. Any anything came from Facebook yet? I didn't see anything from Shabnam the- Shabnam had a question. Can, can I- Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Shabnam had one. Are scientists currently working on ways to store this energy better? Yeah, battery technology, this, this is the lower energy stuff, not fusion. It's just, okay, you can store it into a battery or store it into you know the water. You just put the water up a hill or something like that, and then it comes down. Uh, yeah, I think they are. Uh, I don't know too much about it, but it's happening slowly. <laughs> and so that would help a lot. I mean, if it were, if we had really good battery technology, right? I would say, why even use PG&E? Uh, <laughs> it would be like battery and transmission. Then I would be like, you know, forget about PG&E. Uh, I'll just deal with, you know, Ohio and so not Ohio, but Oregon and Washington. 
I'll just buy my power there and have it transported here. And even with uh, transmission losses, I would pay a lot less money. Uh, I would come out, I, you know, my utility bills would be, you know, 30% of what they are now. <laughs> it would be great if that worked, but right now, yeah. A big problem is we have to use the energy just as it's created. If we could actually really store it, then, then a lot of our energy infrastructure would be a lot easier. Can I ask one more question? Sure, sure. There are no stupid questions. It's no, actually... I, I missed the part <laughs> that you were doing, so uh, we were caught up with these things. You mentioned that you are using this extra energy for looking at asteroids. Uh, I missed the part. For asteroid deflection. So the idea is we've got this efficient, this, this half ROM. I call it a half ROM. I showed that video because the lasers come in one end. It makes this shell hot and the x-rays come out the other end, the closed end. So it looks like it's efficient enough, at least you know, maybe 40 to 50% of the lasers turn into x-rays. The idea is we put some kind of coupon of material like a aluminum or, or silicon dioxide or prescription glasses, BK7 glass. Uh, as a surrogate for the ground, for you know what an actual granite or what a ground material is, and what we do is we put some, you know, velocity probes at the back end of this material to see what actually happens. It's illuminated by the X-rays. It gets shocked, and the back end moves because of the X-ray flash, and then a little later, the you know the half from that nuke, so to speak also explodes and then we see you know the second shock uh, the effects of the second shock the debris hitting it because then we see a jump in speed at the back end so that's the experiments that we're you know setting up uh, designing and modeling right now but we have i think six shots that are going on at the national the laser facility in you know the end of this year and the beginning of, and also sometime in the spring of next year that will explore these things. Uh, the goal, what is the goal? The goal is to actually deflect? Uh, well, I mean, to see if it's an idea we should explore. But yes, the goal is to, you know, if we're maybe 20 years away, uh, these slower processes like a kinetic impactor or a gravitational tractor for asteroid defense may not give us a sufficient, may not you know, provide enough delta V. Uh, so this is sort of, we have a little less time, let's use the nuclear device to produce a little more delta V. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more unpredictable and it's not something we can iterate on. With a gravitational tractor, we could probably move it further away or closer uh, <laughs> to calibrate up the effect. A kinetic impactor, we just maybe shoot one or more. With a nuke, we have to be a little more careful. <laughs> so. <laughs> Plus, we've never actually, we, uh, the last time the US and the Soviet Union shot up nuclear devices into space was the early 1960s. So we don't really have the expertise now to see what can happen, what can make it work, but it should be pretty straightforward. But, you know, as in anything engineering wise, unanticipated, you're going to spend all your time dealing with unanticipated issues. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. If they? Uh, uh, I don't see anything else. For some reason I didn't see Shabnam's uh, thing on the chat line. I don't know. It was, it... Sent, she sent it directly to me. Oh, okay, okay. That's... Uh, uh, yeah, that's Shabnam, you should use the chat line when you're on Zoom. So everyone can see the question. 
So oh, I, well, I didn't want to ask the question in front of everybody because I'm the only non-physicist in the room. <laughs> I'm not a physicist either anymore. <laughs> so I wanted to ask my brother privately because he would address it in a way that didn't make me feel stupid. Uh, oh, this is storing energy would be great. We, we don't have to do a lot of But this stuff. was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for today. I, I really feel like we, we learned quite a bit and Balaj and I are sitting here really enjoying the conversation and it's uh you know it's it's fascinating to look at energy from such a different source particularly when we have to look for longevity in the future for future generations and i think this is a very exciting topic and we might uh, be you had a really power from space you know those uh those solar collectors in space beaming microwave power into the desert sounds like a cool idea <laughs> So, you know, more, more sustainable, long, long, long term. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, we cannot see your face. You can move oh, the yeah, screen this, a little bit. Yeah. Let me, now, if you, uh, let me, let me, I asked Tani, uh, so just I'm posting his email address in, in case you have got some additional questions. I think uh, that will be fine with Tani, right, Tani? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Feel free okay. to ask away. Yes. So, Tanim. Dot Islam at gmail. Dot com. If there's that Facebook group, right? You could put it in there. No, too, this, maybe. This, is, this is the Zoom. So it is automatically because it is. It's on the Facebook, Facebook or on the chat. Facebook, Facebook Live is already on, so they're going to see this thing, what is going on. Oh, I'm I not forgot, sure, I'm did not you sure. want me to record too? Because I forgot to do that. Um, I, didn't see, I, do not, I do not know if the, if the, if the SB, uh, Facebook Live shows the chat box. Maybe it does not, does it? It might be something you have to find out after the, the Zoom okay. call in. Yeah. Tanim. And Tohi, mm. I got to go, so I want okay. to say goodbye. Okay. So we are we are actually uh, close to the end. So uh, okay. so there is no further question at this time. So uh, I have a question me... for Tanim actually, since everybody else sure. is done. <laughs> so, two questions again from a from a layman's viewpoint, right? Um, you talked to, talking about obviously bigger capsules, so. Does that mean that you worry about more of the defects, the larger the capsule is? Actually less, because yes. it's compressed less. We, and I, I, I mentioned we know how to model, reliably model and experiment on capsules that have convergence ratios of 20 or less, or 20 to 25 or less. And because it's you know compressed less, we have to worry about defects and symmetry a lot less. Because, you know, what is 20 versus 40, right? Just compare the two. It's a factor of two, uh, you know, a reduction in size, a factor of eight reduction in volume. And, you know, there's just, uh, if you go through the math, the instabilities, uh, stuff that, you know, will d completely disable uh, your, the center part of your capsule even before you get uh, down to a compression ratio of 35 to 40, will not be an issue at all. You'll still have something very symmetric at a compression ratio of 20. So everything is a lot simpler to engineer and design for if you can get all the action happening at a smaller convergence ratio. And, uh, you know, design, uh, the, the, you don't get anything for free. To make it work, you need to put in a lot more energy mm -hmm. into your lasers or your, uh, you know, pulse power system. You'll have to put in a lot more energy into the x-rays. But you'll, having, you'll have a design that works optimally. It will be a lot bigger. Your capsule will be a lot bigger. And, you know, if it's a factor of, four or five bigger in size, you know, it's a factor of a hundred or so more volume, right? Mm -hmm. So a hundred, a factor of a hundred more, you know, DT gas, right, or DT fuel. And so stuff that was, well, 
it's a nice idea, right? With three megajoules, or if you, in the best case, if you get 40 megajoules, uh, become something that uh, <laughs> can arguably destroy your facility. It'll produce enough energy to destroy your facility, <laughs> which is a nice problem to have. <laughs> and one of the but yes, everything that... gets better if you can make the thing bigger because it oh. bangs uh, at less of a compression. And so it's just easier to, you don't have to deal with instability growth that would destroy your capsule if it tried to get, you know, smaller, a factor of 35 or 40 reduction in size. Okay, thanks. Um, one other question is that, do you have to worry about focusing the lasers if it's too big or that's not an yes, issue? Yes, that is an important issue. Uh, in fact, uh, there's the laser focus through those tiny holes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's the fact that, uh, you use blue light because the plasma, you can have the lasers interact with the plasma that's in there just to symmetrize the X-ray drive, you know, that's compressing the capsule. It's sort of a, it's sort of a heuristic knob. It's not understood. I mean, the mechanism isn't understood, but it's understood at the level of making this change will have a linear predictable effect on the shape of the capsule. It goes from, you know, pancake to sausage to, you know, spherical on, you know, sort of straight up ramps in basically how you change the, uh, the details of the laser, you know, just the aim, just slight changes to the aim. I'm not an expert on this, but it's uh, a predictable, you know, uh, engineerable effect that uh, actually does work. It's we don't understand exactly why it works, but it does work. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm all done. So, Tahid, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, I certainly wish to thank Tanim uh, for a wonderful presentation over here. Uh, we all learned a lot, and the Question and answer session was particularly lively, a lot of interest, a lot of questions. And uh, we can imagine that the future, future is full of challenges, but I'm, I'm hopeful. That One last thing. Getting... <laughs> Would you like to see my parrot if you haven't seen her before? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I've said it before, so, but I'm going is... to see it again. Is it a parrot? Her, or I'll, on here? I'll bring her down just a second. Show her. She or he? She. Oh. Yeah, if the cat particularly is uh, <laughs> <laughs> has has got the canoa, right? No, I have a parrot and two canoes. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh. I see. <laughs> And the flyer in the house, you know. Tawhid and my nice friends. I want them. Abdullah Abu Said, sir. Yeah. Abdullah Abu Said, sir, you, of course, remember. Talk to her. Talk to her. All right. Okay. So, Abdullah Abu Said, sir, Shibli Ashtilo Amra Kwajan Dakota Kisilam. Only somebody, they say, ask the child. Chelemele, Cheleme, put them to Saka Cheleme, who let the Shasha Jai. In the Jokon, Nati Nadni Hoyabe. Talk on our disaster, Barbana. Right. So I think you have crossed this stage. You cannot come back to let, let her talk a little bit. All right. Twinkles. Mwah. Hi, Twinkle. I Hello. Think she's... Could she give the talk? She can talk. She's just little no, give the talk. <laughs> How I wonder what you want. <laughs> She's just missing me. I heard her screeching while I was giving the talk. So I thought she might she want to join me for a little bit. Yeah, she wanted to have attention. Act a parrot. It's a kind of parrot. Uh -huh. Kind of parrot, but not a you know, not typical color. Uh -huh. <laughs> so exactly almost a yeah, Looks that way. Uh -huh.
So let me let me thank the speaker, Hanim, uh -huh. and 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 the, all the participants, and especially my appreciation, my thank you goes to the, all the volunteers who have spent actually hours trying to get this particular portion smooth and easy, enjoyable for everyone. By name, Lucy Hussain. Shaheen Islam. <laughs> we don't know her. <laughs> then then Muhammad Rahman Dulal, Saleh Jahangir, Iftikhar Rahman. Saleh Jahangir is gone. Probably he has to eat now. I don't know. I'm still here. No, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not seeing, here. Seeing, your, see your, seeing your face. Camera, camera is not there. Okay, yeah. defense, okay, here. The, the, the finally, finally, we have recorded there everything. He is, there he is. We have recorded everything. It's on yeah. hard drive. It is. Uh, it is on uh, uh, in the Zoom. Uh, what is called the cloud. So pretty soon I'll be able to convert it and save it, and I will send you the link to YouTube posts or something like that. Yeah, that will so be. I great. have got your. I have got your email addresses, so you are all going to get a link.